you do say something, please just be cognizant of the folks on Zoom and keep it loud and take the microphone, if you will. Um, so in here, we're going to, we're going to talk about community-based response, a lot of which is not really laid out inside this plan. It is one of the, one of the main gaps. There's a lot in here that leans on partnering with Montpelier Alive and Long-Term Recovery Group. There's a lot that the city is not. We've had, I would like to open this up and let this be very much an open conversation about how you feel, what, where you feel the gaps are in the plan, what you think is good about the plan, <laughs> what else needs to be done. Um, yes, Andrea, please tell us the story. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Standard. Um, I participated in the first iteration of CAN, um, which was in 2008, and it was stood up by the mayor and the planning director at that time, and it was in response or in preparation for an anticipated emergency. Uh, a different kind of emergency. It was anticipated at that time that fuel oil prices were going to go sky high that winter. And there was real concern that a lot of people in town were not going to be able to pay their heating bills, they were going to be cold, they were gonna, or they were going to go bankrupt. You know, they were going to just put themselves in poverty. So we stood up, or they stood up, and a lot of people got involved, this organization called CAN, which was Community Action Network, is what it stood for then. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, it was stood up and we did a lot of canvassing of neighborhoods, some basic outlines of neighborhoods were created, and then the emergency didn't happen. Fuel oil prices didn't go sky high that winter. Um, but we learned some stuff from that, and I've been thinking about it a lot as we look at this thing. One thing is the neighborhoods, and even in the second iteration of, of CAN, which was more of a sort of socially oriented iteration where neighborhoods were doing things together and getting to know each other and stuff, was that the neighborhoods were too big. They were just too big. There were too many people. It was too much to organize. And the fact that it was all happening with volunteers and there was no central coordination made it really difficult. Even for groups that did really well on their own and kind of did some great innovative stuff, there wasn't even a way for them to share that with the other groups around the town. So I, I think those are two things that I would like to see us think about as we look at more community-based, neighborhood-based response, preparation and stuff, is keep it small so it's manageable, and recognize that, and this is probably not gonna happen because there's no resources, there's not gonna be a central coordination uh, coming from the city or coming from the commission, I don't think. I mean, maybe, who knows, we'll see. But that would be something to, to aim for, is some kind of centralized coordination. Because um, each group, each neighborhood is going to come up with stuff. They're going to think of things. They're going to come up with ideas. They're going to come up with interesting ways of getting stuff done. And we ought to be, in this case particularly, because so much could depend on it, we ought to be able to share that around. So that if somebody's got a great way of putting together a neighborhood list um, and, and utilizing it, then let's make that more universal so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Um, and I think, particularly in the case of an emergency, we have to move quickly. We have to be able to move fast. Um, and the hardest thing about all this is that we don't know when it's going to come, and we don't know what it's going to be. And that makes it hard to plan. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I'll just respond to one thing. The idea that there's not going to be central sort of coordination either from the city or from the commission. I don't think we know that yet. I think whatever it is that's going to be built is ours to build. And if it needs that, then we'll find a way. I have a question. Does anybody have any recollection of the CAN networks that Andrea was talking about? Were they alive in your neighborhoods? Did you have any experience with them? Would you like to tell us about your experience? <laughs> I'm Meg Baird, and I live in the North Franklin Main Street, Street um, area, 
And I'd say we were active more during the uh, social phase, but our neighborhood got together some of us every month. Someone in the neighborhood from the lecture, and it was a potluck, so it really was a sort of getting to know each other phase. The woman who I think had been involved in the initial phase, she just had gotten burnt out. She didn't even really come to the potluck. She was just so fried from the initial phase. So I think that's one of the things. Is be careful you don't burn out the people to do it because then it falls apart and it's a volunteer thing. I just wanted to say we shouldn't think that if it's primarily social that that's kind of a waste of time because getting to know each other socially is a tremendous way to be prepared to respond to an emergency. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to encourage everyone to understand that a lot of people aren't being savvy. So, sure. Not, um, so a lot of people are not tech savvy. And even though they might have the equipment, they might not be able to hook into all the messages. So we need alternative people, ways to contact people. And that might be a neighborhood coordinator. Yeah. Is that or did you want to say something? I don't usually speak up at meetings because I'm covering it the bridge, but I was a neighborhood coordinator and um, kind of late in the game about a year before it fell apart. My experience on Berlin Street was that it was really, really hard to coordinate in that neighborhood. Um, so Andrea had said, I think it was Andrea who said, uh, whoever's got a good system for getting a neighborhood list, let's share it. I wish I had that at the time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> One other thing, if folks don't mind saying your first and last name before you speak, that would really help me in my recording. Give us your first and last name. Speak loudly, please. Eli Nova. You guys are all talking about the community, the the groups that the neighborhoods but i got flooded out in july four and a half feet of water in my house then after that everyone left people around me left there are only three four houses in my area that still have people and not all of us can actually speak the same language multiple families are immigrants. They do either speak Spanish or in English a little bit, or they don't speak any English. It's really hard for us to communicate. All this community thing won't happen in my area because it's not possible for us to do the communication. And there's very few of us. So what you were saying about communities being too big Arch is really, really small, and we can't communicate. It's really hard for us to. It's hard to do all the community stuff. So that needs to be taken into consideration when we figure out how this is going. Because there are areas, I know I'm not alone, that don't have people all around, that are way less people and it's way harder to connect. Thank you. So I want to recap a couple of things that I'm hearing, and you're, you're taking notes, right? So let me know if, if I'm missing things. I'm hearing that not everybody communicates in the same way. Some folks don't speak the same language. Some folks don't use technology in the same way. I'm hearing that the size of neighborhoods matters greatly. If they're too big, that that's not that that's problematic. If they're too small, that's also problematic. I'm hearing that if they're if the neighborhood activities are primarily social in nature, that that is not necessarily a waste of time because it does keep people connected. Um, and what else am I hearing? Lists, creating lists. 
that we need a system for creating lists, we need to share information from neighborhood to neighborhood, and ultimately we're going to need some kind of central coordination to bring everybody together. And I think that will also, if we can pull that off, that will also sort of help neighborhoods that have these kinds of challenges. If all of the neighborhoods support each other. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Deb Robinson, and um, in our neighborhood, once we decided to try and have a meeting, and several of us came together, and we sat around not knowing what to say or to do, and so it never happened again. And, and, and I'm concerned about that. You know, if we think this is the key to us, I think there needs to be a reason for a, a group of people to come together. Um, if we're trying to build something, then we better be clear what we're trying to build, you know, and, and make sure the people in charge know how to go about doing that. Thank you. My name is Liz, and I've been living here for 14 years, and because of the type of work that I do, I'm been fairly involved with crisis planning in different ways, but this is a very personal question. Because the day of the flood, I probably got, well, what do you know, 50, 58 alerts. And telling me, and this, I'm not sure how this works in the community-based response, but I'm looking at practicality here. When 58 alerts telling me to go to Barry Auditorium, there's no way I can get to Barry Auditorium. It's been a year and a half, and nobody's yet has, have I heard, you know, like, what are we supposed to do? And how we're not going to get to Barry Auditorium. And so it may not be in the right group here. But for me, this boils down to practicality. And it's been very, you know, I've been trying to be patient. And um, I'm not sure of all the enemies here. Which one is going to address the practicality? Where are the food caches going to be? Because they're not going to be in Barry Auditorium for people in my, in my neighborhood. And I live up on top of a hill. Three of my neighbors' basements flooded. People tell me we're not in a flood, flood zone. Three of my neighbors' basements flooded when FEMA came in. And so I'm doing, well, we're doing what we can do individually and talking together on how we can, what we can do with our lawns to try to be flood resistant. But I still don't know where people are going to go for first aid and how they're going to get there. I haven't heard anything. And who's going to take responsibility for doing the setups? Yeah, Red Cross will come in, but I didn't see Red Cross you know, any, anywhere within 20, you know, in what was it, a day, two days? I saw the city manager, you know, I saw people who were sitting, stand, sitting here go downtown and start to help out of us immediately as soon as we could get in there and shovel the mud. But, you know, I, I really resent being told to go to Barry Auditorium. It was just downright stupid. It, it makes me lose faith in the city and the people who run it. So I'd really like to, you know, maybe I'm being over dramatic, but I'd like to have an answer to this fairly soon, before we have another flood. Thank you. Before we go on to Peter, from, from someone from Zoom, I think you should give yourself all the permission you need to be as dramatic as you want, to be as honest as you want. I mean, I, I'm assuming you, you said, maybe I'm being overdramatic, be overdramatic. Okay. Now's the time. This, this is our thing to build, and we're not gonna get it. We're not gonna get where we need to by being nice to each other, and talking around these things, we need to be real. So thank you very much for doing that. Peter, you got someone? Great, so on the Zoom, Carrie Steller says, I'm really interested in how mutual aid can work in coordination in tandem with the more formal structure that the police you met, fire chief was talking about. I think there are a lot of informal ways that lots of things happen in a disaster, but they often lack ways to connect to formal systems without prior relationship building and effort. How can this plan help with that continuity? So it's a good question. I'm trying to not have a lot of answers and opinions and really listen as much as I can, but I've heard a few things that I would like to maybe respond. So when I talk about the, the many fragments and the many gaps that we identified during this, when we, when, with all of the stakeholder meetings that we, that we held, we heard that we heard so many experiences and everyone's perception of what others were doing was almost never what everyone's perception of what they were doing was, if that makes any sense. So for example, and I think this ties directly into the neighborhood organ level organize organizing, excuse me, um, the city was not inactive. The city stood up the hub. The city did the, sent out the VT alerts, et cetera. 
But not everybody received those alerts because not everybody's tech savvy, for example, right? So if you're not receiving them, from your point of view, it's as good as they were never sent out, right? And so I think that many of the gaps that we see are because, well, my next door neighbor, she's, she's not my next door neighbor anymore, but that's irrelevant. So my next door neighbor, I know, has no connectivity to technology. She has a phone and her nearest uh, kids are in Williamstown. So it's some 20 something miles away, right? So when we have boil water notices or we have uh, power outages, we check in on her. We take her water, we make sure that she's okay. I, I feel like that level of neighbor to neighbor is the thing that is going to bridge that gap because some tech savvy person is gonna get the BT alert and they're gonna know these three people are the people that I need to take care of, for example. And I think that, I don't know what the final structure is. I'm not going to pretend like I've got this, some plan in my pocket, although I've been obsessing about it for months and months. I, I, I'm avoiding that. I do think that through us working together to fill in these kind of details and know who in our right-sized neighborhood needs us or who can we count on, they're gonna help fill the gaps for us that the city is just not equipped to reach every single person with one method. Is that? So. Yeah, I would just add to that quickly. Again, Peter Walk, commission member. I think the experience of the 2023 floods was there was a lot of information coming from a lot of different sources into the hub, into the city in various different forms and being able to use, be used to help uh, direct resources around. And what we need to do is figure out how to learn from that experience about the best practices of that and help to make sure that we're doing that on a more regular basis so that we can ensure that all of the ways that we're going to communicate and need to communicate, uh, we're using to the best of our abilities. It's never, it's never gonna be perfect, but we have things to learn and things to, to work on um, and help build out the plan for them. I just wanted to circle back to one thing Mark said. If, if we as scribe are allowed to chime in. <laughs> you're in the room, um, let's go. I think there's a key to uh, what you're saying about who to turn to in the neighborhoods. And um, just hearing a lot of these reflections about like how neighborhoods can feel disconnected even if they're really small. Neighborhoods can feel disconnected because um, there's nobody in the neighborhood identified as a connector. Um, that I think there's something to that and I look forward to um, figuring out in the neighborhoods who can be kind of take on leadership and, and can be somebody to lean on. Um, and I think that that's just a really important piece of neighborhood connectivity. Thank you, Katie. And I want to, I'd like to echo you saying that you're looking forward to figuring it out because expressing a, a gap that was there and waiting for somebody else to fill that gap is one, one method, but ultimately it's going to require action and leadership from everybody in this room to fill those gaps and figure it out for everybody else who's not in this room or for people who can't be in this room. Go ahead, please. And it occurs to me that there's probably a, a, a number of, a number that is the right number of people one neighborhood coordinator can contact. And I say that because I saw I took a look at the neighborhoods described in the city plan, and some of them are pretty large. So I'm thinking that um, seven neighborhoods all go. They need to come up with better than <laughs> Yeah. Also, thank you for beginning to get specific. One of the things, please, please do sign up. Uh, with, it'll come up on the screen later again. John had asked if you're interested in being a part of this kind of work to please sign up so that we can make sure that we can get together. Um, doing that detailed level planning is, we're not gonna work it out here in this room tonight, but we are looking for more people to sort of step up and be involved with generating those ideas and leading those conversations. Go ahead, John. Hi everyone, I'm Joan Javier Duval, and um, my first thing was, is it Liz? Is um, I want, wanted to just respond to your um, question about shelters. Uh, I did see in the plan that on page 33, there are some more local shelters that are in Montpelier that have been 
identified, and I'm sure that still has to be finalized. Um, but I was encouraged to see that there were some locations actually within the city um, to serve as shelters. And um, so my other two comments have to do with my uh, position in relationship to the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, um, serving as the minister there. And first, I noticed that um, in a couple of different places, the plan refers to uh, partners, including secondary partners, of which faith-based organizations are included, which is wonderful. I hope that um, we can be seen as partners um, within our community and specifically on any kind of emergency planning. And I will note that, you know, this was true in July of 2023 that many of our faith communities are right downtown, right by the river. Um, and certainly in 2023, we're in an immediate sense in no position to be a partner in responding. We were the ones in need of um, and very much uh, benefited from volunteers and um and that being said, I think, uh, you know, out of, outside of the crisis time, certainly our church and I'm sure other faith communities would say, of course, we want to be looked to um, as a partner. And so my broader comment on that is just being able to look at the plan and really assess the capacity of those organizations that are identified as potential partners, both in terms of the kind of physical vulnerability of, of these different organizations as well as staffing capacity, et cetera. Um, and then my second set of comments, um, when John was talking earlier, he mentioned speaking with someone whose you know, church was developing their own preparedness plan. That was me who brought this up to John, <laughs> ran into him at Bohemian. And, um, and we are, and I don't know, maybe there are other uh, institutions, community-based institutions in the city that are starting to develop your own, you know, flood, specifically in our case, it's a flood preparedness plan, literally step by step. Um, a, I want to point out that currently it's dependent upon information from the city, right? So it's like, okay, if the city says we're in the action stage, here's what we need to do. If we get to minor flooding risk, here's what we need to do. Um, so, you know, this isn't the communications breakout group, but I'll just point out that that is very, that is like, our plan hinges upon um, the kind of assessment that's happening at the city, state, whatever level. Um, and I know that that information isn't always other, you know, folks are doing your best guess on what is actually the risk level. It's an imperfect system. Um, and, um, and I think it's important for if there are other entities, you know, other nonprofits, businesses, et cetera, um, who are developing these kinds of plans, it would be great to get together and compare notes and, and talk about um, and be able to just share and learn from each other in that way. Um, and then here's just my final thing, really, really super nitty gritty. Um, and this is just an example, like our plan includes, okay, if we get to minor flooding, we gotta find some sandbags and sandbag the back door, right? Um, but I wasn't even sure how to, you know, I was like, I don't think the city provides sandbags outside of the main, you know, State Street corridor. Um, so does that mean we have to fill our own sandbags? Okay, this is a very super micro, but important in the moment, right? Like, do we actually have to stock up on our own sandbags, or is that something? And that doesn't need to be answered tonight, obviously. <laughs> But it, just to give you an example of a very minute detail that's gonna matter in the moment, and so clear communication about what resources are actually available from the city um, is gonna be helpful in the kind of community response. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just real quick, I, I'm just really, uh, two ideas that really stuck with me. One, Andrew, when you were talking about the need for some kind of backbone or central, some kind of central support for different neighborhood organizing groups. And really your anecdote about like you back together. And then there was like, what are we talking There's nothing to talk about, right? And like, it just strikes me that, and I know that it's a, a question of like, you know, exactly how are these are organized, but I think it'd be super exciting and fun actually to put together like a toolkit for 
that neighborhood group that has like, I mean, it might sound really silly, but like discussion protocols of like, how do we do this? And then like the people who host those, you know, to have kind of trainings for them. And you know, that, that kind of um, centralized support, right? If not coordination, at least centralized support and resources, I think is like totally doable. Uh, and I think could be really effective. Yeah, um, Diana Chase, I wanted to just um, respond to what Reverend Joan was saying about the local shelters. Um, it also, the, the Maple also says on page 32, the identified local shelters do not have overnight capacity, but are rather utilized as warming and cooling centers. So I, I, think, I think that you raised a very good question, or maybe you didn't mean it as a question, but more as a firm point, but that the Barry, having the Barry Auditorium as an overnight shelter is um, inadequate. It's, it's not really a solution for Montpelier. Um, so, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention was, um, I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate what I said before. Um, if your group is getting together and you feel like you don't have anything to talk about, you know, making it primarily a social event um, can go a long way and then you can you know, you don't have to have a long agenda. You just need to get to know each other a little bit. I also wanted to mention something about the overnight shelters uh, in Barry and the shelters here in Montpelier. I noted that um, the shelters, the, the warming shelters here in Montpelier are with allowed pets. And um, that's a good thing actually because a lot of people will not leave their homes unless they can take their pets with them. And what uh, I'm with the Central Vermont Disaster Animal Response Team, we operate a shelter for pets in conjunction with the Red Cross shelter in Barry. So if someone needs to get to Barry, I think the city should be responsible to get them to the warming uh, shelters first and then arrange for transportation to Barry. I think setting up a, a large Red Cross shelter is, 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 is pretty involved and takes a lot of preparation. I'm not sure Montpelier is ready to take that on, but there's a system already in place for the region, and that's the Barry Auditorium. And what we do with, the, uh, with our group, it's a volunteer group, we take your pets and we keep them and take care of them while you're in the shelter because Red Cross at the present time will not allow pets with their owners in the shelter. So uh, the other thing to remember is that to get FEMA funding, uh, a city, uh, any municipality has to provide a plan for dealing with people and their pets. It happened uh, in Katrina where people would not leave their homes because the pets were not coming along. They wouldn't let the pets come along. So everybody stayed behind and a lot of people died because of that. And so there's a requirement in law, it's called the Pets Act, P-E-T-S Act that requires municipalities to make sure that you take care of your pets in your community also if you want to get FEMA funding. I'm not sure how strict they are, but it's a great law. What's the name of the organization you're talking about? Our organization? Yeah. Central Vermont. First of all, I'm John Angelosik, I didn't say that. And I'm with the board of the Central Vermont Disaster Animal Response Team. Liz again, and just a heads up, um, what I've been doing is tracking Asheville and the responses by people in Asheville and in the Western Mountains there and now in Florida, um, because we all may have connections in both of those places, but I'm learning a lot from what they're doing and how they're doing it, and sad to say, Florida's had a lot of experience and we don't have to reinvent the wheel sometimes and we can really grow and take some really good information including not just pets, but um, people who may have dementia, or Alzheimer's, and other challenges like that, is how to prepare them in advance. And you don't have to wait for something to happen. You start the conversation sooner rather than later. But again, I'd highly recommend looking at, say, say Lake County in Florida, in Central Florida, near Orlando, and what the Red Cross is doing there, and um, other community and community-based responses that are happening there and in the villages. In Leesburg, you may know people up there. And then in Asheville, um, which is very um, very community-based and has a long tradition 
in the mountains there of people helping one another is to really look at the social system there and what they've developed and how they've done it and how they're pulling through with it. So I just want to give a heads up to that, to learning from others. I'm Judy Walk. Um, I live on Liberty Street, and I was never quite sure what my, where my neighborhood actually was. Um, and I have a couple random thoughts. Um, one is that if there are other communities, as Liz was just saying, who have tried some of these things, um, and somebody's picked up and, and collected that information, I don't know if, if your group is, is starting to look around for examples in other communities and other states, um, but that seems like a good place to check. The second thing is, as I think about my own near neighbors, and if I knew that I was part of a pod of, say, what, seven or eight, nine houses, and we all kind of took it on ourselves to have somebody on duty at any given week, uh, just for communications and you know checking on each other, um, I could see that working no matter what broke down elsewhere. Um, so that's just a random thought. And finally, at those, what to do at those meetings? If it was social and a chance to have a little, what would we, how would we all do it if something bad happened here? And have that conversation and get some creativity going, then it would serve two purposes. I do think you're hitting on something that is, that it will, inevitably be a function of these sort of groups, which is to run the, the fire drill equivalent of whatever disaster we choose to name for our neighborhood, where do we meet, how do we rely on each other. But the one thing that you said that I'm really gonna hold on to was the idea that if I were in a pod of you know a small number of houses and we just rotated who was sort of on watch, that that seems very doable. And I really like that idea. Um, I'm sort of following up on that same thing, uh, and I borrowed this from the animal disaster response team. They do a thing called go bags. How many people have heard of a go bag? Okay. So I've heard a lot of stories over the last two years of people who suffered greatly for the things that they lost, um, either logistically lost in the sense that it made life difficult, like you lost your driver's license, your wallet, your credit cards, et cetera, or things that were really important to them. Um, the idea of the go bag is it's very personal. There's some lists that exist online and they're very helpful because they give you some basic things that you should think about what should go in your go bag. And now I'm gonna ask a hard question. How many people have a go bag right now Okay, and I don't even have one, and I've been thinking about this for weeks and months. So I think this could be a good organizing tool for getting local neighborhood groups together, which is to sit down and talk through, along with some resources, what goes in a go bag, what's it for, what do you do with it, how do you think about it, all of that stuff, um, as a place to start. And it could be fun, it could be social, and, and I think there'd probably be a lot of laughter involved as we all discussed what was most important to us and that we had to take in our go bag. But um, I think that's an important thing. And the other thing I wanted to say is the fact that this plan currently says that the in-town shelters, with the exception of the senior center, are all places that have historically flooded, really doesn't make any sense to me. And I think the other thing that neighborhood groups could do is figure out who's got a space in their house or in the neighborhood that people could gather at and be safe, out of the rain, out of whatever, temp even just temporarily. Um, and I think I do understand totally the whole thing of a Red Cross shelter. You don't even get to decide where the Red Cross, Red Cross shelters are. The Red Cross decides where it's gonna put the shelters. Um, but I think we have to think about what resources do we have in the town for actual, safe, accessible places that people with varying degrees of mobility and you know capability and stuff could go to if where they are is not safe. Um, and I think that would be a good gap to be filled in the plan is to really think about where are those places. Um, and they might be people's individual homes, but they might just be you know, spaces we haven't thought of yet. 
to tap onto that and then also something, Joan, that you had said. There is, there is something that is not in the plan. We, we say who these secondary partners are. These ultimately need to be named entities that have a memorandum of understanding between the city and each other. So it, it cannot be that, oh, well, we think the Unitarian Church would be a good partner, so they're the part, they're a partner, right? It, it has to be a, a thought out plan and, a, and an agreement for everybody to do that. Um, uh, you and then, and then you. Hello, my name is Nolan Carver. I reside on Winter Street with my mother and a special needs client. We're from one of the old proud families of Montpelier. Uh, we're from one of those old quaint Victorian neighborhoods where we still sit on our front porch and talk to our neighbors. Uh, there used to be dozens of kids in our neighborhood, but now there's only just a few. Uh, but there's plenty of elders. And as a you know, grown man, you know, in my 40s, I have to take into account that I have a certain luxury in this world, and that is having strong legs to walk up the nearest hill in case there's a flood. And I think that's where we're all headed, just upwards. So just remember to keep your head above water and move upwards. And having that go back, that's key. I remember this uh, flood was so traumatizing because my neighborhood was separated from the rest of Montpelier. I didn't see any cops or, or ambulances in my neighborhood, but I would have really liked to know, have known that they were all up there on Berlin Hill, working together between uh, these twin cities and this Montpelier Valley. It's so small, we're gonna have to consolidate our, our resources upwards and have that power structure physically upwards. Uh, this is such a small Montpelier Valley with such an intense watershed. So we're talking about resilience and I'm wondering what my ancestors were thinking when they designed this capital city. <laughs> and if they could have imagined uh, the extent of our manipulation of the environment, perhaps uh, they would have um, let Chittenden County or some other county uh, accept this title. It's quite an honor to be the capital city. And it's so fascinating here because we're America's small town. And so we get to function as a village if we want to. But I think since the 1980s and 90s and aughts, we've kind of just sort of stopped walking away from community. And we're kind of one of these sleeper towns that depends on City Hall for everything. And I think it's time, you know, for us to start, you know, making those family connections. We had to take care of my mother, that's important to me, so I don't have to wonder or worry. And I'd be more than happy to get involved and take care of the other elders. And uh, speaking of distant, you know, we're gonna have to learn new languages to communicate with a new uh, vocabulary and lexicon, because uh, that's how we'll survive and thrive in these changing times. Thanks for listening, Mark. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned you have the luxury of strong legs and you're taking care of your mother. And so those of us that have that luxury of strength and ability or means also then have that responsibility and duty to carry the rest of the folks who don't have that luxury, right? So thank you, we look forward to your participation. Hi, I'm Cheryl Eklund, and this is my son, Jasper Eklund. And um, we have um, the luxury of living up by the college, and so we were not worried about flooding. And so we have the luxury to come downtown and help our downtown area that we care greatly about and our neighbors. And so I am very interested in how we can help be organized as a community to come down and help sandbag as we've done before and we do know where we can fill the sandbags and i do i have heard there's a new plan that we're going to have sandbags available and somebody asked earlier about sandbags they were available on both december and this last july 10th and community members were able to come take them as well as we were downtown helping with that so I do think, you know, there's there's room for all of us to help with not just our neighborhoods, but also our beloved downtown that 
we all cherish so much, and we really want to have a, a role in this. And I also want to speak to the fact that we have an amazing site. It is actually a gauge right in the Winooski River. I monitor it all the time since we have flooded, and um, that's how we were um, we were alerted before on July 10th, this last July 10th, that it was gonna maybe go over again. And so what we did with our neighborhood is start mobilizing the people who live up by us to come downtown and help. So this will also help when the city might not get out the alert, which I felt came out later, but I was watching this very carefully. So all of us should have this on our phone and be ready because it, it gives a beautiful gauge. It shows when it gets too high. It even gives a prediction. And as far as I have seen, it's been very accurate. So um, it's great we have people taking care of each other in our villages, I mean, in our neighborhoods, in our next door neighbors, and that's amazing too. But we, it's gonna take all of us to do all the pieces of this amazing town that we get to live in. So I'm super interested in that role. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jen Roberts. Um, this was leads right into what I was going to say and actually answered some of it, which is that our downtown has some residents, but a lot of us live up out of town. And in when the July 10th, this, this year's flood was imminent, um, some of us who have businesses in town came back down to help sandbag. And, um, find sandbags, which was an issue at the time. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was it was a it was a pretty small group of people who came down, and it did seem like somehow the word hadn't gotten out that we needed a lot of help. We needed a lot more people. We needed a lot more sandbags, and we also didn't know how to sandbag. Actually, we were kind of guessing, and we ended up blocking some doors that people needed to come out of that were you know, residential doors, because we didn't know. We just sandbagged everything, and we didn't even know we were doing it right. So I think, um, to build on Cheryl's point, the downtown is common for a lot of us, and we, I think we do need, maybe as part of our neighborhood group, we could figure out a way to have, you know, a part of our neighborhood response be to go down, the, the people who can do it, um, to go downtown and help try to preserve those buildings. Say your name of business for Cassandra's. Jen Roberts, my name is Rogers. Uh, case in point, though, the one Microphone. neighborhood, the one neighborhood in uh, in town that I feel like is doing this really well, and the only reason I maybe the only reason I think of this is because I'm part of the communication and I see it is the downtown business community. They, when it starts raining hard, everybody's talking about it, and they're there's a tremendous amount of support and understanding of what what each other need. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, um, I would say for us the most valuable communication tool, sadly, because I dislike it very much, is a Facebook messenger, right. like messenger message that is this ongoing thing between businesses. But that's where we went to look for information about, you know, who needs help, who's sandbagging, who you know, who couldn't be here tonight because they had to go somewhere. So yeah, I, I think the downtown business community is, is very tuned into that, but um, I do think there's a lot of improvement that could be made on how we communicate and how we communicate with the rest of our community. Yep, I'm very excited to have your leadership <laughs> <laughs> move us forward. Thanks, Mark. Uh, this is a quick comment again, Peter Wunk, uh, commission member. Uh, I'd like to think about a plan is the first step in the process. If we don't practice this, if we don't exercise this, if we don't figure out what sandbagging looks like in specific buildings and doors and all those things, it won't work. So that's part of the, if you read through the materials about making sure that we have the appropriate amount of emergency operations support from the city and whatnot invested in the process to make sure that we can be successful moving forward. And I would ask, I, I, I know there's a lot of focus on flooding right now. It's totally, totally appropriate. However, the reason why that there are uh, warming centers and other things in place of the flood is because we're not always, the flood's not always gonna be the disaster that we're dealing with. And the, so City Hall may be a completely appropriate place to gather in that event. So we need to be, we need to 
you know, we're very focused on the crisis du jour. It's normal human being behavior. Let's try to step back and think out what else could be possible and, and make sure that we're thinking about the ways in which we can support our communities and, and neighborhoods through whatever disaster may come. So, thanks. Uh, Sarah Jarvis, Terra Street. Um, just two quick things. One is just uh, that I think there's a lot of capacity in the local business community that is not the down core downtown um, that is, you know, on the outskirts of Montpelier, uh, that, but that has, uh, you know, staff that can be mobilized. You know, my company, we, we gave a lot of people PTO time to do disaster recovery, and so that is um, just another resource, I guess, to tap into. <coughs> And then just to continue talking about the shelter location issue, um, the I mean, Peter's, Peter's point is, of course, a good one that the, the what the shelters are used for depends on the disaster and how, how useful the location is. But to the point of a flood disaster, um, the problem is that there's no public space that is not outside of the floodplain. Montpelier doesn't own any property, city, city proper doesn't own any property it's outside of the flood thing other than the water treatment plant, which is up the hill, of course, that doesn't have public capacity. So I think it's something we might want to put a plug into the conversation that's happening about the country club property, that as that gets developed, that they think about having some capacity there as an emergency shelter location. Thank you. Um, so we've got about two minutes. I, I think I'm, I'll just say a word and wrap it up. Is that where we are, John? Two minutes, so however you want to Okay, so I'm, I, if anybody wants to say say something, please raise your hand. But I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing here tonight, um, partly because the things we're hearing are very much in line with the things that the four or six or 15 of us are, are throwing around. So it, it tells, it, it's a good indication that we're not far off base from, um, from what, what I'm hearing from the community at large, or at least the people who show up in this room tonight. Also, I'm very encouraged by the, by people's recognition that those of us who have the luxury of means are responsible for carrying others. I feel in Montpelier, I, not just tonight, I felt it the whole time that there's a tremendous sense of willingness to show up for our neighbors. And I think that's going to be the thing that makes this work. And I do just want to remind everyone that, that having that willingness to show up is a huge part of it, but that showing up is the main part of it. And what we really need in these next steps are for more people to come forth and say, raise their hand and say, I would like to be a part of planning how we're going to do these things, how we're going to have go bag workshops and work, work checklist workshops, how we're going to teach each other how to not sandbag a door and sandbag a door, how we're going to communicate with each other when the waters start to rise and say, all right, everybody, we're meeting at this location. At the moment, we don't have those mechanisms to do that other than ad hoc, I'll text a friend and they say something and maybe a Facebook messenger post, right? So those are the details that we need to fill in. We're counting on everyone to please sign up, spread the word outside of this room to people who couldn't make it tonight. Please sign up if you're even just curious about what the next steps are. We really need everybody's voices and we really need everybody's legs to carry us up the hill. So thank you very much. Just one last thought. I often think, wonder about what's going on with the people across the river. Um, you know, because there, there's a lot of people who live up there still in our municipality. There are. And a lot of them showed up to muck out basements, and a lot of them are, are I mean, they're very much a part of our community. Does anybody else want to say anything else before we, yes? Just say your name again for a second. Um, my name is Jasper Eklund, and um, I was just wondering, I saw on like social medias and stuff about um, other types of flood barriers that might be easier to set up, like um, maybe like these plastic barriers that were like able to keep water out, if those could be easier for like businesses or people to set up than having to go fill and like get sandbags when you could just put up like a plastic barrier in front of your house in like 20 minutes and that would be set up 
versus like going back and forth, being sandbag, saying I'm up in the right way. It's just, I was just wondering if you guys looked into that kind of stuff or. So um, have we looked into that specifically? No, I mean, I've seen the same videos that you're talking about and they do look super cool, but <laughs> I haven't gone beyond the step of watching the video and suggesting, I mean, there's, no, thank, thank you for that. <laughs> Anyone else? Should we take a little break, or is everyone coming? Yeah, I think people will be back shortly. So, yeah, a little break. I, I think we'll be in other rooms. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll just take a we'll take a brief break until everyone comes back. We're going to share amongst the rooms what was said in the other rooms, so that people didn't get confused.